Good morning. We uh, turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. We'll be there in a moment or two. Thank you for being here this morning. We are always grateful to have our family together, and uh, it's, it's just a wonderful thing to be together. Um, we are going through a series this year on this passage here at the beginning of the book of Romans. It says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Holy and pleasing to God, this is your true worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Earlier this week, I went to my wife and I said, what should I preach on this week? And she goes, well, you're doing a whole series on this passage of Scripture, but you don't actually plan on ever talking about this passage of Scripture. And I said, you know, that's probably a really good point. And uh, maybe I should actually spend a sermon talking about this passage of Scripture, which is not really in the series that we're going to be talking about, but I do want us to kind of pick apart this idea uh, that's presented here for us about this idea of renewing your mind. This is a really, really hard thing to do. And I don't know that we truly... Uh, appreciate what we're being asked to do here. We're going to look at this passage in its context in just a moment. But I want you to do a little bit of reflection before we get going. When have you, as an individual, ever had to really renew your mind? Now, we change our mind all the time. That's one of the ways in which we're different than God. We just sang a, a fantastic song, uh, Praise to God, You Do Not Change. And we marvel that God is so perfect that he does not change. He gets to be consistently, constantly, inerringly perfect from beginning to end. We're not that way. We change our mind all the time. We forget things. We change our, our attitude on things. But even though we are constantly changing as people, my question is, when is the last time you ever did the work to truly change the way you think? Because that's a really difficult thing to do. And I, I would dare say that if you ever, if you can come up with an example, that it is something that, that was, it, it took a lot of effort and a lot of intention, and a lot of purpose, and a lot of training, and, and re-evaluating the way you approach things to accomplish the task. Maybe, think, Adam, you're going too far with this. I, I don't think you'll think that when we get through discussing what it means. What Paul here asked these Christians to do is, is extremely difficult. Uh, you, know, you put this in the context of where it falls in this book. The book of Romans, the first 11 chapters, spent a lot of time essentially trying to argue with the to change, and to change the way they thought. At first, he talks a lot about the Gentiles and the way that they lived without God and that they needed to change and realize the value and their need for Jesus. And then by the time you get to chapter 3, really into chapter 2, he does the same thing for the Jews and tells the Jews, you need to realize that you are no better off than the Gentiles, that you also need to change, you also need Jesus, you also need to realize that you are not perfect. He concludes that section with Romans 3.23, or at least that's near the conclusion, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And you get into the rest of this early section, and it's all about how we need to recognize our sin, our failings, our, our humanity, our difficulties, and we need to be willing to change from that. We need to be people of faith. We need to have our sins washed away. We need to stop sinning and giving ourselves to sin. By the time you get to chapter 9, he spends a lot of time talking to the Jews about how they 
considering themselves superior to the Gentile because they felt like they were God's chosen people. And if they weren't God's chosen people and the Gentiles were also accepted, then what was the point of all the Old Testament stuff? And because of a, a racial superiority over their br Gentile brethren. And Paul actually spends 11 chapters arguing, you need to get things right. You need to change. And so he wraps that up with, so, understanding the mercies of the Lord, you need to be willing to sacrifice yourself for the benefit of God and for the benefit of the group, and you need to have enough humility to be willing to change not be like you've always been, but be something better than you were and practice discernment and obedience. That's me rewording verse 1 and 2 of chapter 12. But that's essentially what he's doing. He's saying, now that everything out on the table and all the ways you've messed up and all the ways you see the world wrong, you need to be willing to change. You need to be willing to Quit being conformed to the world, but be transformed. And all of that comes from being able to renew their minds, which means learning better, thinking better, having better control of themselves and control over their very thoughts. There's a passage over in 2 Corinthians where Paul tells the Corinthians that they are to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Let me repeat that. Every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. How many of you are good at that? You know what that means? We need to learn to renew our minds. We all have this task in front of us of changing the way we think. Changing the way we perceive, changing the way we learn, changing the way we adopt those things in our lives so that we might live a more obedient life, not just in our actions, but even in our thoughts. All of that requires... And I'm not sure that we truly appreciate how difficult that would have been for them and how difficult that is for us. I, I've never surveyed this group about this one question. I, I don't know how many of us in this group came from Christian backgrounds or how many of us came from a worldly background. Now again, I know we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've already quoted that passage. I know that we've all been worldly-minded on occasion. I, I'm not disagreeing with that. But there is a difference between someone who grows up with very little understanding of God, Jesus, and morality, and somebody who grows up in a moral home where you are trained to have certain habits and understandings of the world. And I don't know how many of us in here have gone to the, to the great lengths of worldliness to Christianity. But that's the kind of change we're talking about here. The kind of change we're talking about for these early Christians would have been those Gentiles who believed in a multiplicity of God, who used to just living a riotous life full of sin and immorality because there wasn't really a moral code based on religion for those in the early centuries, uh, if you came from a Gentile background. You lived the way you wanted to as long as you weren't the gods mad. And for those who were Jews, they grew up in moral households, but they grew up with this, with this chip on their shoulder. They believed they were better than everybody else, and everybody else was not just less than them, but everybody else was no animal. That's the way the Jews grew up. You weren't allowed to eat with them. You weren't allowed to touch them. You weren't allowed to associate with them. You didn't go into the Gentiles' home. They were a despised and awful rejected people, and you weren't to associate with them at all. 
comes up. And he says, you Gentiles, you've got to start living a moral life and according to a code that you've never lived for before. And you, you Jews, you have to start accepting people that you've always despised and rejected because God has accepted them and therefore you need to accept them. Paul was asking them to change the very worldview they had, the very fundamental ideas on which they based all their other understandings of the world. Paul said, you need to erase everything you've ever known, and then we're going to do something new. Do you see how difficult this would have been? And for many of us, I can talk about myself, I grew up in a Christian home. My dad was a preacher. He was a very faithful man. My mom was a very faithful lady. They taught me the scriptures. I probably had more scriptures memorized as a kid than any other person that I knew, minus probably my older brother and sister. We had regular Bible times as a family. It was a regular part of our life. I didn't ask if we were going to worship. I knew we were going to worship because that's what our family did. There was no exception to that rule. It wasn't even an expectation that we might not go. Even if we were on vacation, we went Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. There was no breaking of that. That was our family culture. And so when I became a Christian, guess what? My culture came with me. That was a part of, of what I had always experienced. And so for me, there wasn't a lot of renewing that had to happen. In a lot of ways, that's a great blessing. But in some ways, that's difficult. This idea of renewing your mind is, is a hard concept for me to wrap my brain around because I've never had to do a lot. I, I've had, a, my brain has, from the beginning, been trained the right direction. So there hasn't been a lot of renewing high calling that we've been asked. There's a song by Sister Hazel, some of y'all might know them, but they have a song called Change Your Mind, and it's all about if you don't like the way life is going, what you do is change your mind. The chorus says, if you want to be somebody else, if you're tired of fighting battles within yourself, if you want to be somebody else, change your mind. And they have the right idea here, that, that the, the way to bring about a different result, a different end, the way to different feelings about life and different feelings about the way we view things and, and have a better feeling about who we are and what God wants us to do is to start with your mind. It starts there. You've got to train your mind to be what God intends your mind to be. And so that's what Paul deals with here. Now I'm going to reword some of Romans chapter 12 verses 2 particularly in modern language that we would typically use, but I want to relate it to what Paul tells us here. For instance, we need to learn to ignore the voices that are currently in your mind. You start looking up how to better life and how to make things better. That's one of the pieces of, of advice that will be out there. You need to learn to ignore the voices. We're not talking about schizophrenia here. We all have voices in our head. We all have ideas that constantly present themselves to us. And you've got to learn to ignore those things. That's what Paul's saying when he says don't be conformed to this world. Learn how to ignore the things that the world is telling you to do. Learn how to stop being like the world. Another piece of advice in our modern world we might hear is learn to listen to the right voices. Learn to find the right places where people are going to speak truth into your life. They're going to say good things to you. They're going to make you feel more truthfully about yourself. They're going to speak about your value. They're going to speak about good things. And that kind of is what Paul's saying here when he says, be transformed. Instead of being this, this thing that you've always been with all the struggles and difficulties and all the negative ideas, be something different. Be transformed. Be changed. 
And then this idea of, well, learn to, to listen to the voice of the one who has the right answer. Find the source of truth. That, that's the idea of you learn to discern. You learn to, to be able to tell the difference between the bad and the good. You learn to be able to, to recognize what is true versus what is false. Because you're no longer just letting the world dictate to you what you should be doing. And then start living intentionally, following him, his direction. The idea of uh, approving what is good and pleasing and the perfect will of God. That as you start living for God, as you start doing things God's way, that starts to manifest itself into good things in your life. You start to see that God's way is better, that it is good, it is pleasing, it is perfect. Because it, gets, it becomes proven in your life. Now, all of that is, is this idea of learning how to retrain your brain or change the way you think or gain a different perspective or be able to essentially make your brain work in a way it's never worked before. Renew your mind. That's what Paul's asking us to do here. We have to, as God's people, learn, learn to let our mind be crafted and molded by the will of God. Not by the world. Not by the things the world tells us. I, I'm going to, and, and again, I, I know I harp on social media often, but I'm going to say what I think is probably the most damaging thing social media has done and the lives of Christians today is it has inundated us with false ideas so much that we've started to believe them. It has so our brain with worldly ideas that sound good, they aren't good because they're not truth. Things about believe in yourself. Well, really? So I'll be honest. On my own, I've gotten myself into a lot of messes. I've made a lot of mistakes. And I've done things that I shouldn't have done, all because it seemed right to me. Whereas what I should have done is believe in God and let him be the guy. Things about how you are valuable Am I, though? I know that sounds mean to question that, but, you know, I'm valuable because God has seen worth in me and because God has done good things for me and because God has brought me salvation. That's It's not in some sort of, of, of self-value or something I've achieved on my own. That, that, what does any of that do? kind of filled our minds with this idea of, of achieve on your own, that you should work hard so that you can overcome on your own. The Bible teaches that. Not right now it does. Tell you to achieve. It tells you to depend on Him. And those are two very different ideas. And, and the Social media has, has filled our minds with the world's ideas and we've let down our guard about them and we haven't at the same time filled our minds with God's ideas and let God's ideas win. Because that's what we need to do. We need to let God's ideas win. So let me give you a couple of practical steps that I think can be helpful to us as we try to retrain or renew our minds. One is, hear the constant voice of Scripture. Hear the constant voice of Scripture. That's hard. Because we're distracted in a lot of ways world that we live in, you know, we don't have 24 hours a day to go hear scripture all the time. 
But I guarantee you that probably every single one of us in this room could hear Scripture more than we do. We could make simple changes in our lives that make hearing Scripture more often a reality. If you've got a commute, instead of turning on the radio, or most of us just let our phone's music player take over, just one side of your commute, either to or from, let your scriptures play. And think about the scriptures for that 10-minute commute. That's a simple way to add some scripture. Or turn on hymns. You know, our hymns are full of scripture and Bible ideas and thoughts about God and, and worship statements that we should be dwelling on. If you're really, really determined to listen to music, then listen to some hymns. Not saying it's wrong to listen to other music, to take an extreme point of view here. I'm saying we should, as God's people, to let Scripture speak in our lives a little bit. The thing to do, it just takes making that choice. Sit, spend some time in Scripture, and let it build the way you think. Second step is pray. Pray. Pray some more. Pray with purpose. Uh, we, we do not pray enough. And I, again, I, I don't know what your habits are, but I can tell you without fail and without any hesitation, you do not pray enough. I don't. We don't sit down and take advantage of the privilege that we've been given to speak to the Creator of heaven and earth. So pray some more. I, if your habit is to pray uh, a few times a day, add another. If your habit, maybe, maybe you can start a new habit. Uh, first thing you do when you get up in the morning is get up from your bed, and while your coffee is brewing, spend that time in prayer sitting up at the table so that you don't just fall back asleep. But pray. It could be that the, 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 the way to do that is on your lunch break, take 10 minutes of your lunch break that you've wasted searching through social media, turn it off, and spend 10 minutes in prayer. I don't know how you add it. I just know you need to. Spend some more time in prayer. It will make a big difference in the way that you think because it will, if you get into the habit of praying, you know what happens the next time you need to pray? you know you need to pray. You don't immediately jump to something else. You immediately jump to prayer if prayer is your habit. And we need to be people who have a habit of prayer. Evaluate your thoughts and discern where they're coming from. This is a big one. Big modern phrase that often gets used is talk to yourself instead of listening to yourself. There's a lot of wisdom in that. Talk to yourself instead of listening to yourself. Make sure you are thinking right and intentional thoughts. I, 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 all of these are, are built into Scripture in multiple places. You know, this idea of, of spend more time in prayer, that's what Paul tells Timothy that he should give attention to the public reading, or excuse me, not more time in Scripture, give attention to the public reading of Scripture. How many times in Scripture do we see examples of the Christians in, in distress turning to prayer? How many times do we see that being a, a major part of what the early church did? But this last one, this, this one here, evaluate your thoughts and discern where they're coming from. That's not really talked about a lot in Scripture. Here's why I think it is a scriptural principle. We live in a way that if we're not careful, the world is going to pull us down the way it wants us to be. We've just got through studying First Peter in our adult class here in the auditorium. Uh, actually, we finished Second Peter today. I'm kind of myself for that one. But First Peter, we spent some time 
And uh, multiple times in that letter, Peter talked about how the Gentiles are trying to pull you back. They're trying to pull you back in. They're trying to make sure that you run in the same ways that they run, that you involve yourselves in the same things that they involve themselves with. They want to see you walking the same way they walk. And they don't understand why it is that you've decided to live in a different way. And they, they can't understand that. Well, that's because these Christians had learned to discern where their actions and thoughts were coming from. You have the same kind of idea in a passage we looked at today, which is 2 Peter chapter 2, where it talked about verse 20, uh, or excuse me, verse 19. They promised them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption since people are enslaved to whatever defeats them. You hear that? Now, that doesn't say what's on the screen word by word, but it says the same idea. This idea of, of, of you know, these people are promising you something they don't themselves know. They're promising you freedom, but they're enslaved. Which means you need to, the underlying in-between line statement here, is you need to be careful who you're listening to because they're promising you what they can't deliver. You need to be able to discern and evaluate whether what you're hearing and what you're thinking truly is able to deliver. Or are you letting yourselves be enslaved to something without any concern? You've got to be careful about that. Fourth practical point for us to consider is identify the lies and replace them with truth. Identify the lies and replace them with truth. Jesus says over in John chapter 8, the truth shall set you free. The truth shall set you free. What's interesting is that if you look at that passage of Scripture, he was talking to a group of Jews who liked to, to argue that they were free. They believed they were free. They believed that they had, they even made one statement at one point, we have never been enslaved to anyone. Ha <laughs> ha! Apparently they'd never read their own scriptures. They'd been enslaved over and over and over again, had they not? They'd been enslaved in Egypt. They were enslaved in Assyria. They were enslaved in Babylon. They had been taken captive by multiple nations in between those events. Even the people who heard those words were essentially slaves of the Roman Empire. While they had some freedoms, they had freedoms at the pleasure of the Roman Empire. And they knew if they upset the powers that be too much, they were in trouble. They knew they weren't free. And Jesus knew they weren't free. Yet they were willing to believe that lie because it was easier to believe the lie and hold on to what they believed in than it was to accept the truth that they were wrong, that they were enslaved, and that they needed to be rescued. We can fool ourselves in the same ways, folks. We can fool ourselves with a false sense of security that just has no truth behind it. Number five, remember you belong somewhere else. Paul tells the Philippians, for our citizenship is in heaven. It's in heaven. We belong in heaven. Our king resides in heaven. Destiny is heaven. We belong somewhere else. We don't belong here. And when we recognize that, it changes the way we view the world. It changes the things we think about the world. It changes the way that we approach the world. We no longer feel any pressure to fit in where we don't belong. Because we realize we belong somewhere else. Last one, remember, you're not alone. You're not alone. 
You have a community of people around you who want to help you. Uh, we're told over at the end of the book of James, this idea of if a brother helps, uh, a, saves a brother from sinning, he has saved him, excuse me, saves a man from an error of his way, he has saved him <clears throat> and uh, saved his soul from death and he covers a, a multitude of sins. Brothers and sisters, we're not alone in this. And I'm going to tell you right now, the best way to renew your mind is to get around people who already think the way you want to think. There's a principle in business of you are the sum total of the five people you spend the most time with. You're the sum total of the five people you spend the most time with. Which means, the reason that is true is because we tend to think like the voices we hear the most used to drive my wife nuts back when I was doing real estate, uh, that I would listen to certain podcasts, and I would come in like, "Woo, let's go. I've got plans to make. I've got goals to do. I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. And I'm like, all about things, and she would go, you listened to a podcast, didn't you? She knew it every time. The reason is, we tend to be that way. We tend to adopt the thinking and the, and the enthusiasm or the depression of the people that are around us. We tend to become like the people we with. We are changed by the voices we hear the most. Let me tell you right now, if the voices you hear the most are voices from the world, you will live like the world. And if the voices you hear the most are voices of those fellow citizens of the kingdom of God, you will live like people from the kingdom of God. Because you will be like the people you're around. I encourage you to take advantage of the community. The community of God's people that can make a difference in your life. Renewing your mind is not an easy, it is not a simple, and it is not a quick process. But it is a necessary one. Because without renewing your mind, you will never be able to discern what the will of God is, nor live the will of God. And so I encourage you to do the hard work. If you're like me, Probably most of what's in your mind's in, in pretty good shape, right? I mean, you, you do spend some time in the Word of God, and you do pray, and you do have faith, and you do recognize that God is the God, and that you're going to live a certain way, and there are certain things that are priorities in your life because of Jesus. And, and you have lived and, and put into practice a certain way of life. That still does not mean that there aren't things in your mind that need to change. Maybe it's putting your eyes back on the hope of the future. Maybe it's seeing your identity in Christ and the value that you have because of Jesus, not because of yourself. It could be that the renewing of your mind comes in the form of, of placing the right priorities in your life in place, so that you can be around the community of God more. Whatever it is, make the change. And for those of you who are not children of God, I'm going to tell you, you have not only the job of renewing your mind, but renewing your life too. But God makes that second part pretty easy. If you're willing to let Jesus be Lord and you're willing to be baptized into Christ, you can have your sins washed away today and start living this new walk, this new path.